The Hubble Space Telescope is arguably one of the most famous of all telescopes. It's named after this man, Edwin Powell Hubble. Born in the United States in Missouri in 1889, died in 1953. After serving in the infantry in the First World War, he went to the Mount Wilson Observatory overlooking Los Angeles in California. There he had use of the 100-inch Hooker telescope. He made many, many important discoveries. He helped to start establishing the scale of the universe, measuring the distances of some nearby galaxies. But he's perhaps most well known for his discovery that the universe was in a state of expansion and that all of the clusters of galaxies are moving away from all of the other clusters of galaxies as that expansion takes place. So it's fitting that the Hubble Space Telescope should be named after him. Now the telescope was launched on the 24th of April 1990 and here you can see it blasting off safely stowed in the cargo bay of the shuttle Discovery. Once in orbit around the Earth, the telescope was gently lifted out of the cargo bay with the robot arm and it was released and it floated away in space. And here you can see the telescope in its operational configuration. The lid at the top of the tube allows the light into the uh, mirror assembly. So it goes down to the uh, bottom of the, uh, the main mirror, which is 2.4 meters in diameter. And that's about two thirds of the way down the tube. It's then reflected back up to a secondary mirror and then back down again through a hole in the primary mirror. And so the main instruments of the telescope are located behind the main mirror, which is to the right of the telescope as you're looking at it there. Now, the reason, of course, we want a telescope in space is because the Earth's atmosphere means that when we observe distant objects in the universe from the ground, there are always effects from that atmosphere. The atmosphere is often a bit murky and uh, it's always in motion and this blurs the fine cosmic detail. And so by putting the telescope in space, we can obtain very clear images of distant objects, much better than is possible from the ground. And we can also see a lot more detail in those images. Now here we can see the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope around the Earth, the orange curve there. It's at a height of 335 miles above the ground, and it's going around the Earth every 95 minutes. As the telescope orbits at the Earth at fantastic speed, it has to have a very complex system of guidance and tracking system on board so that when you lock on to an astronomical object, you can maintain the lock on that object over many, many orbits of the Earth to carry out the long exposures you often need to observe the objects that astronomers want to see. Now, when the telescope was launched, they knew that it would need continual maintenance and upgrading. It would soon get out of date. And so the telescope was designed to be serviced by crews on the US Space Shuttle. And here we can see the Space Shuttle with the telescope sitting on a platform there at the back of the shuttle's cargo bay. There were a number of these servicing missions and they ensured that the telescope was kept in tip top condition during its lifetime. Astronauts would work in pairs, in shifts, to carry out all the work that would be needed for maintenance, repair, and even replacing complete instruments within the telescope itself. The first of those servicing missions was in 1993, and that was a very important one because it installed a module called CoStar that corrected a very small error uh, in the main mirror. And from that time on, Hubble's images were superb. The telescope has been involved in just about every area of astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology over the years and uh, its observations have been really very important indeed. And what I would like to do in this talk is just to look at some of the highlights during the telescope's 30 year career. Now, the thing about the telescope is that every year on the anniversary of its launch on the 24th of April, they release these days a new image to celebrate that anniversary. 
Now, in the first 10 years of the telescope's lifetime, they didn't really tend to do that. So what I have done is I've assembled a few images from those first 10 years between 1990 and the year 2000 to give you a flavor of some of the things the telescope is looking at, but also some of my own personal favorites and highlights from the telescope's career during the decade of the 1990s. This, by the way, was the logo created in 2000 to celebrate the 10 years of Hubble being in orbit. And really the first time that during that 10 year period that the Hubble telescope came to great prominence was in 1994 July, when a comet called Shoemaker-Levy 9, which had been torn apart by the gravity of the giant planet Jupiter, producing a long string of pearls of cometary fragments, one by one, the Hubble telescope saw those fragments plunge into the atmosphere of Jupiter. And here you can see a composite of a Hubble image of Jupiter and that long string of icy fragments from the broken up comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And for a period of a week in July 1994, we watched as each fragment hurtled into Jupiter's atmosphere at 60 kilometers per second and exploded with the energy of a nuclear bomb, producing these dark bruises in the atmosphere of Jupiter, again magnificently shown here by the Hubble Space Telescope. And because the first Hubble servicing mission had taken place in December 1993, Hubble's optics were in superb form, able to record this incredible event in great detail. Another image that I remember from that time was this beautiful storm in Saturn's atmosphere. Saturn is always one of the most beautiful of objects to look at. And here we can see a very bright whitish storm in the equatorial zone of the Lord of the Rings. And that is in fact uh, ammonia gas that's been pushed up high enough in the atmosphere to freeze into bright white ammonia ice crystals. So if you like, it's a sort of a, a blizzard in the upper atmosphere of Saturn. And now for something completely different. We have here uh, the Cat's Eye Nebula. Now this is an example of a planetary nebula, the death shroud of a dying sun-like star. Now, this particular uh, object was created by the star in the middle. The star grew old, it became unstable, and then it began to puff off its outer layers in a series of shells of gas and dust. But then, about a thousand years ago, for reasons we don't fully understand, the pattern of emission of those shells of material changed. And this produced the beautiful cat's eye structure in the center of the nebula. And it really is a, a quite beautiful object. It was one of the first planetary nebulae to be discovered. And the Cat's Eye Nebula, certainly uh, one of the highlights of Hubble during the 1990s. Also, during that period, we had this image of the Cartwheel Galaxy. Now, uh, this galaxy is around about 400 million light years away from our own Milky Way. And it shows something very interesting. It shows an example of an interaction between two galaxies. The Cartwheel Galaxy, which is the large galaxy on the left, has had a smaller galaxy probably the bottom one of the two on the right. And that galaxy has passed through the disk of its larger neighbor almost at right angles. In other words, traveling from left to right as you look at it in this picture. And as the smaller galaxy has passed through the disk of the larger galaxy, a shock wave has traveled out from that point, compressing the gas and producing a ring of starbirth around the edge, hence the name the cartwheel. And another uh, lovely example of these early images from Hubble. Now, one of the most massive stars in our Milky Way galaxy is called Eta Carinae. 
It's about seven and a half thousand light years away from the sun in our own galaxy. And here you can see a Hubble image of Eta Carinae showing those remarkable lobes of gas on either side. And this is sometimes called the homunculus nebula. And Eta Carinae is a very massive star, one of the most massive stars in our galaxy. And its lifetime will be very, very short, typically only a few million years. And then it will explode as a supernova. The star will blow itself to smithereens. And this is an image showing a star in turmoil, a massive star getting ready to go bang. And uh, that's exactly what will happen at some stage in the not too distant future. Now, Hubble has made many important discoveries amongst its tens of thousands of observations over the years, but probably this is one of the most important. In 1997, an instrument on the Hubble telescope called STIS, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, and you can see the blue oblong there, which is the slit of the spectrograph, and it was looking at the core of a giant elliptical galaxy called M84, which is about 50 million light years away from our own Milky Way. And on the right, we see the output from the STIS instrument. Now, it shows uh, a green line that goes rapidly blue to the left and rapidly red to the right and then goes green again. And this shows that there is a very small disk of material orbiting at incredible speed in the very center of the galaxy. And this disk must be rotating at about 880,000 miles an hour within only about 25 light years of the very center of this giant elliptical galaxy. And that tells us that lying at the center of this giant elliptical galaxy, there is a super massive black hole weighing as much as 300 million suns. And here we see an artist's impression of just such uh, a supermassive black hole. The black hole is right in the center and the material spiraling round it in the so-called accretion disk, spiraling down towards the event horizon. That is the disk that the Hubble instrument detected rotating at such high speed around the core of that galaxy. Above and below the accretion disk, uh, some material is uh, ejected by a shock wave around the central vortex, and that produces jets shown here in blue at right angles to the accretion disk. And in these jets, you get electrically charged particles, electrons traveling at almost the speed of light, and these produce radio emission, which can be picked up by radio telescopes. And also, the material in the accretion disks can be heated to hundreds of millions of degrees, and that produces X-rays. So we can also see evidence of these supermassive black holes in the cores of these giant galaxies by the radio emission and the X-rays that they produce. Coming back to something much nearer home now, in March 1997, Mars, the red planet, was very well placed. And here are three lovely images from the Hubble Space Telescope of the red planet Mars. And at the time, 1997, these were the best, clearest, most detailed images of Mars that the Hubble Space Telescope had produced. Now, of course, now we have spacecraft in orbit around the planet. We have spacecraft from roving vehicles on the surface of the planet. But these views by Hubble give us a global view. They enable us to track uh, daily variations in weather, seasonal changes, climatic changes on the red planet. And over the years, such images have been very, very important. Now, in 1996 and 1997, Hubble also made another valuable contribution. It acquired the first of its so-called deep field images. And this is an image of deep field south. 
basically the telescope stares at a point in the sky for many, many orbits. The light is collected and summed. And what you're able to do is take a core sample through the universe to show very, very distant galaxies. And using deep field images like these, and Hubble has taken many, many more in more recent years, it is able to allow astronomers to study the most distant galaxies in the observable universe, the most distant galaxies that we can see, galaxies that existed when the universe was only about a billion or so years old. And this was the first of those deep field images acquired in the 1990s. Here we see an object, a globular cluster. There's a halo of about 150 of these around the outside of the Milky Way. This one, which is called uh, uh, M80, is around about 33,000 light years distant. And it contains several hundred thousand old, highly evolved stars, but packed together in a very tight ball. And uh, these globular clusters contain many of the oldest stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Coming back into our galaxy, and now only 2,000 light years distant, we have one of the most beautiful examples of a planetary nebula. Earlier, we saw the cat's eye nebula. In this superb image, we have the ring nebula in Lyra M57. It's, as I say, 2,000 light years away. The actual ring of gas is about a light year or so across. And it's the result of the star right in the middle. This star, which is a, a, a star of a fairly low mass, similar to the sun, maybe a bit more massive, has gone through its life. It's evolved. It's swelled up to become an enormous bloated red giant. It's then become unstable. It's then puffed off its outer layers in a series of shells. The white hot core is exposed, and you can see that right in the middle of the nebula. And around the outside, we have these beautiful shells and rings of gas, another example of a death shroud of a dying sun-like star. So those were some of the highlights of the first 10 years of the Hubble telescope in orbit. And interestingly, I was reading a press release that was issued at that time in which it was stated that the Hubble telescope probably would continue operating until 2010 when it would be replaced by the next generation space telescope. Well, that has now been renamed the James Webb Space Telescope and it still hasn't been launched. It's due to be launched in the spring of 2021, but it remains to be seen if that happens. Now, because the James Webb Space Telescope is long behind schedule, Hubble is still going strong. So contrary to that press release in 2000, Hubble was not uh, put out to grass in 2010. It's still going strong after 30 years. So what we're now going to do is have a look at some of the official anniversary images that were released in 2005, 2010, 2015, and this year in 2020. Now, in 2005, to celebrate Hubble's 15th anniversary, two images were released. This is the first one, a dusty spire in the Eagle Nebula. Now, the Eagle Nebula is about 7,000 light years away in the direction of the constellation of Serpens Cauda, uh, M16, it's called. And we're now going to fly into the disk of our galaxy, the center of our galaxy is to the right there, and we're going to fly right into the starbirth region that is M16, that is the Eagle Nebula. You can see the dust and gas of our galaxy. You can see those pinkish clouds of glowing hydrogen gas caused, excited by the newborn stars within. And as we go right into the Eagle Nebula here, we can actually see three dusty pillars. Now, the image that was released 
in 2005 is not of these pillars, but these particular pillars gave rise to one of the most iconic of all Hubble images. This one here, the Pillars of Creation. And the original of this was released in 1994. This is a later version. And these three fingers of dust seen in silhouette against glowing gas behind are detail of a starbirth region. Each of those dusty fingers is four to five light years in extent, which is about the same as the distance between our sun and its nearest neighbor, Alpha Centauri system. So the image that was released in 2005 was of a rather different part of the Eagle Nebula, a different dusty spire, showing more detail of the structure of these uh, elements of dust that you find inside starbirth regions. And here we're going to just pan up the height of this spire, four to five light years, looking at the beautiful structure revealed here by the Hubble Space Telescope. These dusty pillars appear to be very common in starbirth regions and we'll be having a look at one or two more of these a little bit later on. So that was the first of the images released in 2005 to celebrate Hubble's 15th anniversary and this was the other, the Whirlpool Galaxy in Carnes Venetiki, one of my favourite all-time Hubble images. It shows a spiral galaxy to the left and a small uh, dwarf galaxy to the right. And these are uh, neighboring galaxies to each other. But the, both galaxies are about 30 million light years away from our uh, own Milky Way. Now, this is a beautiful image by Hubble because it shows not only the spiral structure of the whirlpool, but it shows the numerous pinky clouds of star birth, clouds of dust and gas inside which new stars and new planets are being born. If we zoom right into the heart of the Whirlpool Galaxy, we can see here that the uh, structure is beautifully shown and it shows the power of Hubble that it can reveal such detail in a galaxy 30 million light years away. Now, you can see there are a great many starbirth regions. It appears that this galaxy is going through an episode of starbirth. And that may have something to do with the small dwarf galaxy over to the right-hand side. Computer modeling has shown that this small dwarf irregular galaxy has made several passages through the disk of its larger neighbor. And the shock waves produced by that have set up these uh, incredible bursts of star birth that you see all around the main galaxy. And it appears that the little galaxy to the right is si slightly set back from the plane of the whirlpool itself. So you can actually see at the top there, one of the spiral arms actually overlays part of the smaller galaxy. So the smaller galaxy is uh, orbiting the larger one and causing various effects on its nearer neighbor. Now, here we see the whirlpool and its small companion again. This image is what we call a visible light picture. But Hubble is capable of observing not only invisible light, but also in the near infrared, and in the near ultraviolet, a wavelength just either side of the visible spectrum. But Hubble was only one of the so-called great observatories. And very often, astronomers would observe an object, not only with the Hubble Space Telescope, but also with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which would look at the infrared, and with the Chandra X-ray observatory. And by combining the information from these three great observatories, we can learn a lot about the object we're looking at. But we're now going to look at what happens when we look at it with the Spitzer Space Telescope 
and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and we studied the galaxy at infrared, visible, and X-ray wavelengths. Different wavelength observations reveal different structures in the galaxy. And this is very important for helping us understand it. Here, we've made a, a computer model of the galaxy, and we can take a spin through the galaxy's spiral arms and see its pancake-like structure. Visible light will show the older, yellower stars near the center, and the younger, bluer stars dotted along the spiral arms. Infrared light uncovers the oldest and reddest stars that are found across the entire disk of the galaxy. And X-rays reveal the energetic emission from binary star systems that might include neutron stars or black holes. X-rays see the most energetic objects in the universe. We've already talked about the bright pink nebulae along the uh, dust lanes in the spiral arms. These are where new stars are born. And the most massive stars will die in supernova explosions which heat the surrounding gas to X-ray temperatures. So we can learn an enormous amount studying an individual object in different wavelengths. The infrared glow from gas and dust here exposes the detailed structure in the spiral arms. The Whirlpool Galaxy, and uh, there it is in visible light. The core of the galaxy does contain a supermassive black hole. We talked earlier about a supermassive black hole in a giant elliptical galaxy, but it appears that most uh, large and medium-sized galaxies, even spirals like this one, have massive or supermassive black holes at their cores. Cool dust outlines the hot gas in the star-forming regions around the edge where dense clouds collapse and the next generation of stars comes forth. So that's the importance of multi-wavelength observations by the great observatories. Now in 2010, the 20th anniversary of Hubble, we have a different object. Mystic Mountain, it's called. It's another one of those dusty pillars in a star birth region. And I'm going to show you a very wide panorama of the Carina Nebula. Now this is the Carina Nebula. It's an incredible series of images by Hubble showing a very wide field and it shows a star birth region in all its glory. The different colors revealing different densities and compositions of gas. On the left is the area around that massive star Eta Carinae that I mentioned earlier the massive star that's about to go bang. Again, this whole nebula is about 7,500 light years distant. Eta Carinae has already had a number of tantrums and it's blown bubbles in the surrounding gas. And you can see those bubbles to the left here. But we are now going to move in towards the right-hand side of the image where we will find the mystic mountain structure. That was the subject of Hubble's 20th anniversary image. And uh, you can see I put a little yellow circle around there to show you mystic mountain. And if we now turn it the other way round, it's the same as the image released by the Space Telescope Institute, at ESA and NASA, to celebrate the 20th anniversary. This, again, is another one of these dusty spires seen in silhouette against glowing gas behind, which shows us the complexities of star birth regions. And as we fly into Mystic Mountain, we get a sort of sense of the 3D structure of this region. And we can see in great detail the dusty parts, the gas, these areas are often very turbulent and stars will often have a dusty cocoon around them and then stellar winds will push away the surrounding dust and gas, exposing the structures within the dusty pillar, as you can see here. Now we come on to 2015 the 25th anniversary of the launch of the Hubble telescope and another magnificent star cluster, another magnificent star birth region, Vesta Lund 2. 
This again is in our own Milky Way galaxy. It's about uh, 20,000 light years distant in the Milky Way. And we're seeing there a cluster of very young stars indeed, about 3,000 of them, about one to two million years old. Now, this cluster of stars is actually embedded in a great cloud of gas and dust. And you wouldn't be able to see the stars at all if we hadn't combined the information from a number of Hubble's instruments, which have allowed us to sort of peer through the veil of gas and dust around to see the young stars themselves. And these young stars, many of them have not yet fired up to become proper stars. The temperature in their cores is not yet high enough for nuclear fusion to begin. The process of converting hydrogen to helium, which will be the process that will generate the energy that will make them fire up as stars. The bluish stars that you can see scattered across the image are in the foreground between us and the Vestalun 2 cluster. Now, young star clusters like this produce lots of ultraviolet radiation, which ionizes the gas around, and also strong stellar winds, streams of electrically charged particles that push out away from the stars and slowly excavate a cavern in the surrounding gas and dust. So here we see the edge of that cavern. And you can see how the winds from those stars have pushed away a lot of the material. Some of the material is easier to erode than others. And you can see there, again, more examples of those dusty fingers or pillars poking out towards the central star cluster. And as we fly in towards the Vestalun 2 cluster, you can see those pillars of dust, very similar to the ones we saw in the Carina Nebula Mystic Mountain, very similar to the ones we saw in the Eagle Nebula. And to me, when I see these pictures, these pillars of dust always reminds me of the stalactites and stalagmites that you find on the walls of a terrestrial cavern. But this is a cavern carved in interstellar space by the winds from the stars in the Vestalund II cluster. And there we see it beautifully displayed. So what would the people at the Space Telescope Institute choose for the 30th anniversary image. Well, here we would travel outside our own Milky Way, but not very far, to the large Magellanic Cloud. Now this is a small dwarf irregular galaxy that is a satellite of our own Milky Way. There are in fact two Magellanic Clouds. The large Magellanic Cloud you can see here in this beautiful image taken by uh, Stenek Barden from the La Silla Observatory in Chile. And it shows the stars and gas and dust in this galaxy. There is another Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud, which you can't see here, and that is a little bit further away. The large Magellanic Cloud, about 163,000 light years distant. The small Magellanic Cloud, about 200,000 light years distant. And we are now going to fly in towards the large Magellanic Cloud. Now, even though this is a fairly small dwarf, irregular galaxy, a satellite of the Milky Way, it still has clouds of gas and dust inside which new stars are being born. And right in the center there, you can see a bright pink blob, which is the Tarantula Nebula, which is the largest star birth region in this little galaxy. Indeed, it's as large as some of the largest star birth regions in our own Milky Way. To the right of the Tarantula Nebula, is the region where the 30th anniversary image of the Hubble telescope was acquired. And we're now going to fly into that region even closer than this. So you can see there the band of the Milky Way, the disk of our own galaxy with its dust and gas arcing across the picture from left to right. Below center is the large Magellanic Cloud and below and to the left of that, the more distant small Magellanic Cloud. We're going right in to the LMC, to the outskirts of the LMC, to the region 
where the 30th anniversary image was acquired. In we go. And we're going to see two very, very different nebulae that are themselves part of a giant star forming region in the outskirts of the LMC. One of these objects is pinky red. The other one is a lovely blue color. So here we can reveal the 30th anniversary image of the Hubble Space Telescope. It consists of two separate nebulae, both part of this giant star forming region, as I mentioned. The upper one, NGC 2014, the lower one, NGC 2020. Uh, the letters NGC, by the way, mean New General Catalogue. It's basically a list of all these different sorts of objects that we see in the sky. Now, NGC 2014, which you can see here, is a star birth region. Most of the stars here are much more massive than our sun, maybe 10 times as massive, maybe more massive than that. And these stars produce powerful ultraviolet radiation and strong stellar winds. And as that ultraviolet radiation streams out from these stars, it ionizes the hydrogen gas around. In other words, strips off the electrons from the atoms. And when those electrons eventually recombine with the nuclei of their hydrogen atoms, they give out a very distinctive red light, as you can see here. So we are seeing here mainly the light of hydrogen gas and the nebula being lit up by the light of newly born stars embedded within. Now that's NGC 2014. Its companion, NGC 2020, is something quite different. So here we see a close up of the cluster of massive stars at the heart of NGC 2014. And in a moment, we're going to start to pan across towards its neighbor, NGC 2020. Although the two are clearly separate objects, they are both part of the same giant region. Now, it's clear at a glance that NGC 2020 is something quite different. And this is a really very interesting object indeed. It's a bubble of gas blown by the star right in the middle there. But that star right in the middle is a one of a very rare type of star. It's called a Wolf Rayet star. These are descendants of the most massive stars. They are already still massive stars, but they're producing an enormous amount of material because they are losing mass. These stars lose a great deal of mass in powerful stellar winds, and they also push out a lot of very powerful radiation. The Wolf Rayet stars are very massive, very luminous stars with surface temperatures of between 50,000 degrees C and 200,000 degrees C, which is far hotter than other classes of stars. Now, what's happened here is the Wolf Rayet star has puffed off shells of material. But the powerful radiation coming from the star is heating that gas to over 11,000 degrees C and ionizing not the hydrogen, but the oxygen atoms in that gas. And when you ionize oxygen atoms and they recombine, they give out this distinctive blue light. The hydrogen gas, which is further out, is uh, not shown here, but it's the oxygen that is being ionized by the incredibly powerful radiation coming from the Wolf Rayet star within. Now, these Wolf Rayet stars, many times more massive than the sun, will eventually explode as supernovae. In a few million years, maybe less, this star will blow itself to smithereens in a supernova explosion, and there will be another bubble, a shock wave from the explosion of the central star. You'll notice that the star is not quite in the center. And that's because that the way the Hubble telescope has imaged this, the material around the star is sort of cone shaped. 
And the way we're looking at it, the cone is slightly lopsided to our line of sight, which makes the star look not in the centre as we look at it. So there we are, the 30th anniversary image of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's unclear how long the Hubble Space Telescope will continue to provide these amazing views of the universe in which we live. Maybe when the James Webb Space Telescope is launched, Hubble will be retired. But even if it is retired, its contribution to astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology is absolutely amazing. And I've only scratched the surface here in showing you some of the highlights of Hubble's 30 years in orbit. Long may its work continue, and long may it continue to provide us with these amazing views, these beautiful views, this cosmic art, if you like, of the universe in which we live. <laughs>